Good afternoon. My name is Cecile, and before we begin, to begin today, um, we'd like to say that we are offering a Spanish interpretation. So I'm going to say this instruction in English, and our translator will repeat it in Spanish. When we're finished explaining this, we will switch on the interpretation button, which will be a globe at the bottom of your screen next to the chat and Q&A box. All audience members should click on the interpretation button. If you want to hear the conversation in English, you'll click the English. And if you want to hear the conversation in Spanish, you'll click the Spanish. I would just like to thank Kay Stubbs and Ruth Warner for your interpretation services today. Ruth, over to you to explain it in Spanish, and then we'll be turning on the button. Buenas tardes. Vamos a tener interpretación simultánea en español para esta sesión. Entonces, en unos momentos van a activar uh, la interpretación y en esos momentos va a aparecer un globo en la parte inferior de la pantalla para en, si está en computadora. Y si está en teléfono, van a ser tres puntos y ahí lo puede acceder. Es importante que todas y todes escojan su idioma de preferencia para que puedan escuchar, si, si gustan escuchar en inglés, el inglés, o si gustan escuchar en español, el español. Si no, no van a poder uh, escuchar todas las presentaciones. Así que le agradecemos a Ruth y Kay por la interpretación y ahora se va a activar. So we'll switch the button on now and you should all be able to see it at the bottom of your screen. Give folks a second to do that. 
Thank you for joining Black Women's Blueprint and the National Organization for Women's final session in our series, 100 Days of a Feminist Agenda, Healing from Centuries of Oppression. This week, our conversation is entitled Addressing the Femicide, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. As folks continue to join, we invite you to let us know in the chat box where you are joining us from and some basic housekeeping. We'll be doing our best to keep the conversation to one hour. We will have a Q&A session towards the end of the hour. We would like to hear from you. Please type your questions for our panelists in the Q&A box and use the chat box for comments and reflections. Please understand we try our best to answer as many questions as possible, um, but we also try to balance the time we have together and the rich conversation that will be happening today. All of our events over the past few months have been ASL accessible, and we'd like to thank today's ASL translators, Santana Chavez and Kaylee Lind from RGC Access, and a huge thank you to them for being a part of the series. With that, I'd like to welcome our moderators, Kristen Herring and Dr. Christina Castro, to take you through the rest of the afternoon. Hi, welcome y'all. My name is Kristen Herring and I'm president of Austin Now. We are excited to have y'all join us tonight for our listening and discussion series in collaboration with Black Women's Blueprint. Over the course of the past four months, we have gathered together in conversation from all across the traditional lands of Turtle Island, which is one of the indigenous terms that we call the North American continent. We acknowledge the indigenous Holocaust that included slavery, the breaking of over 500 treaties, Manifest Destiny, the Indian Removal Act that led to forced relocations, boarding schools where the motto was kill the Indian, save the man, paper genocides such as blood quantum laws and allotments, forced sterilizations and forced hysterectomies, the erasure from mainstream media and education, as well as the characterization of racist mascots. We honor the many indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, as well as other indigenous people who inhabited, held sacred, and stewarded this land. The bold advances women have made in recent decades haven't advanced as much for black indigenous women of color, LGBTQ2S+, and gender non-conforming people. Our communities have been fighting colonization since 1492. But finally, with six natives in Congress, 843 LGBTQ2S plus members serving in elected offices across the US, 53 uh, representatives who are African American, as well as three senators, 12 representatives who are Asian, and three senators who are also Asian and uh, Pacific Islander. We have 39 reps and four senators are part of the Latin community. Finally, we are at the table and we will be validated. The Biden-Harris administration has committed to uplift our much needed diverse voices, but we know there is so much that needs to be done to truly make a difference in our lives and in the lives of the women we serve. Our listening series is for the first 100 days has been an extraordinary opportunity to delve into issues that matter to us. Um, I guess it's my turn. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Christina M. Castro. I am the co-founder of Three Sisters Collective, an indigenous woman-led collective in Ogapogue, Santa Fe, New Mexico, seeking to recenter an indigenous presence and rematriate our, our city, which is on unceded Tewa territory. Uh, the legacy of violence against indigenous women and children began with the colonial conquest of Europeans coming to the new world over 500 years ago, and it still persists today. In North America and across the Americas, scores of missing and murdered indigenous and First Nations women and girls, um, often referred to as MMIWG or MMIWGT2S, which is inclusive of our trans and two-spirited relatives, is an acronym created by indigenous journalist. Initially, uh, it was an acronym created by indigenous journalist Sheila North Wilson in 2012. But I just wanna acknowledge that this uh, issue has existed 
and there's been activism long before on uh, in our southern uh, with our southern relatives on the other side of the imposed colonial border. Um, these issues do not get mainstream attention. Um, yesterday, May 5th, is the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered uh, Native Women, Girls, and again, our LGBTQ trans and two-spirited relatives who are um, very vulnerable. Um, it's a day of observance that was also signed into proclamation by um, our uh, newly elected president um, uh, to begin to further address this issue and um, shining light on the staggering number of abducted and murdered indigenous women and girls. So I just wanna take a moment even just to breathe based on what um, my previous um, speaker, Kristen had said, it's very heavy. Um, those of us who are working in the movement right now, it's, it's, it's we're in the crux of it. And um, so bear with us. And even if this uh, webinar goes a little longer than planned, uh, bear with us because there's a lot to be said. And I think indigenous women need the space to, um, to fill through these issues and uh, talk them through. Um, and, and, and feel because it's heavy. Uh, in the US, the homicide, homicide is the third leading cause of death among Native women ages 10 to 24. Native women are the victims of murder more than 10 times the national average. Extractive industries like mining, logging, fossil fuels are some of the largest perpetrators of violence, trafficking, and murder against Indigenous women. We talk about the land body connection a lot in, um, in our communities about what happens to the land is happening directly to the people. Uh, these um, extractive industries bring an influx of transient male populations to work in rural areas that often includes our reservations and tribal communities um, in the form of man camps. Uh, the economic hardship in rural areas also in Mexico bring young indigenous women to work in the maquiladoras, the factories in cities like Juarez, just four hours away from us here in New Mexico. Uh, it's long been the epicenter for missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, in 2019, there was 1,500 documented cases of murders that took place in Juarez, which probably um, is a lot more than that. Um, that was the fourth deadliest year on record. I don't know what the, what the statistics look like uh, here now in 2020. And this evening, uh, we will discuss the crisis and explore the ways in which we can activate to support efforts to end femicide. So please take a moment to breathe. Just breathe. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists for this evening. Um, Obeja Negra is an Afro, 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 excuse me, Afro Fronteriza rapper, artivist, feminist, migrant, and cultural promoter. That was a mouthful, sister. Uh, and Jean Jolene Holgate is a sister of mine, um, wonderful, intelligent training and education director at the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women and co-founder of the Missing and Murdered Dene Relatives Task Force. Uh, her work is phenomenal and I can just imagine uh, Obeja's is too down in Juarez and we want to dive right in. So um, for their full bios, uh, please visit the website, uh, the NOW website and links will be dropped into the chat. Thank you all for being here, Ta'a, Tekanofa in my languages, and um, it's great to have everybody. So uh, let's jump in, Kristen, you go first. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, so this first question is for Jolene. Christina just mentioned in her, in her introduction some of the statistics and causes of the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Can you give us a brief overview of the current situation for Indigenous women in North America? Thank you for that, Kristen. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina, sister. Very happy to be here in this space with you as well as um, these other amazing fierce women. Um, as Christina mentioned, my name is Jolene Holgate. I am Dine from Northeastern Arizona, transplanted here to uh, Tiwa territory in so-called Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, thank you for having me. And to answer your question, I think, um, I think one common thread that definitely has been plaguing tribal communities in terms of the missing and murdered crisis is the natural resource extraction industries. Um, there is a direct link between uh, land body violence uh, as it pertains to our women and our most vulnerable populations. Um, a lot of folks, just to also illustrate this, if we were to think about this in terms of like domestic and sexual violence, 
um, is consent. Um, when these natural resource extraction industries come into our communities without meaningful consultation or um, just to basically set up shop and have these man camps and, and not get the consent from the people, that's also making it okay for um, these non-native transient folks who are in these man camps to inflict that same violence without consequence um, against our women and most vulnerable. That definitely is, is constantly at the forefront. Um, we have the line three situation that's going on up north with our relatives. And then even here in New Mexico, we have Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory uh, known to be um, not only extracting from our land, but also polluting our lands. Um, we also have some natural gas wells that are in the checkerboard re regions of the Navajo Nation um, where it's emitting these toxic gases that are actually odorless. And the only way you can detect them um, is through special machinery. Um, so this ongoing violence against our folks is happening um, without that consent of communities is making it okay for violence to be, inflict to be afflicted against our um, indigenous relatives. So definitely the, the natural resource extraction industry. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the gender-based violence that is taking place against our, especially our women, our trans and our two-spirit relatives. Um, I think when we have these conversations and Christina has definitely been a strong proponent of this message is that we need men at, this, at the table to have these conversations. Um, indigenous women have been carrying this work for so long and it's time that we shift some of that responsibility on those who generally are inflicting that violence uh, against our most vulnerable people in our in our communities. Um, so this is a call out to men, start having these conversations, uh, start being a part of the missing and murdered um, solutions and really start talking about how do we mentor our boys to have these healthy, uh, healthy masculinity, but also um, being aware of what's happening to their mothers, to their sisters, to even their grandmothers. Um, my background is in the realm of sexual and domestic violence uh, before I got into the missing and murdered uh, issues. And some of the cases that I have been privy to involve, you know, um, children as young as uh, six months and grandmothers as old as 84. So the violence that's taking place against our women, um, our trans and our two-spirit relatives, um, doesn't know age, it does not discriminate, but there's so much that we can do right now um, to start uh, finding those solutions. And it does take having our, our male relatives at the table. Also, I just wanna also acknowledge the fierce community groups that are taking the lead on a lot of these conversations. One being the Three Sisters Collective, Missing and Murdered Dinah Relatives, um, uh, even amazing groups such as Sovereign Bodies Institute who are trying to help with this issue in ways of through data to illustrate what's really taking place um, and just want to acknowledge that. And that's what it looks like out there. That's what we're fighting against. That's what we're advocating for. Um, but also we need to be taking a family centered approach um, to the missing and murdered crisis and hear them. A lot of the times when missing and murdered cases happen, Families become their own advocates, families become their own investigators, and those are the voices that we need to be hearing. Completely. Thank you, Jolene. Should I um, move on to a question for Obeha and then we'll hop back and forth? Pop one. Great idea. Okay. All right, Obeha, um, this one's for you. Femicide in Central and South America is a massive crisis as well, as I mentioned. For more than 20 years, the mothers of the murdered and missing women and activists in Ciudad Juarez have been trying to get justice for women there. Can you give us an overview and update about the situation? Sí, claro. Muy buenas tardes a todas compañeras. Eh, compañero, compañeras presentes. Eh, es para mí eh, de mucho, de mucho eh, gusto poder estar acá y compartir eh, estas palabras. Y bueno, eh, lamentablemente el feminicidio en Ciudad Juárez específicamente 
de donde soy originaria, pues ya hace más de 25 años que, que nos adolece en esta ciudad, ya que en la actualidad no hay justicia ni castigo para los responsables de, de estos actos. Eh, eh, con mi actividad artística he tenido la oportunidad de acompañar a madres en búsqueda de justicia y con mis propios ojos he constatado cómo las autoridades son indolentes, indiferentes y son omisas a estos, a estos hechos y, y lejos de hacer su trabajo que es investigar y dar con los culpables y, y aplicar la ley, pues han, han, hecho, han hecho caso omiso y lamentablemente hoy por hoy no podemos hablar de justicia para las mujeres asesinadas y desaparecidas, para las niñas asesinadas y desaparecidas en Ciudad Juárez, pero aún más lamentable a nivel país en México Hoy por hoy, 11 mujeres son asesinadas cada día por ser mujeres y en la actualidad tampoco existe una, una cifra que corresponda a las mujeres que han sido asesinadas o desaparecidas. Y lejos de, de encontrar la empatía por parte de los gobernantes que están en los puestos donde deben de resolver estas, estos hechos, Hoy por hoy, lamentablemente, vemos cómo al presidente eh, este Manuel López Obrador también hace caso omiso a estos hechos donde el ejército, la policía, es, están inmiscuidos en desapariciones y asesinatos de mujeres en, en México. Pero aún más triste todavía es que en todo el Avia Yala, en todo América, eh, las mujeres siguen siendo botines de guerra porque cuando hay conflictos sociales como actualmente en Colombia donde nuestras hermanas y compañeras han denunciado violaciones por parte de los elementos policiales y militares hoy por hoy tampoco las autoridades correspondientes se pronuncian en contra de estos actos aberrantes ¿No? Y hoy por hoy también vemos como las mujeres somos catalogadas como mercancías o como botines de guerra. Y es muy triste y doloroso que sigan pasando los años y ver que ya no es solo en Ciudad Juárez que esto sucede, sino que hoy por hoy pareciera que nos hemos acostumbrado a escuchar y ver a nuestras hermanas mujeres asesinadas y desaparecidas. Y lamentablemente también las mujeres trans en esta frontera, en este país, México, en Avia Yala, también aparte de socialmente eh, no reconocérseles como mujeres, también cuando aparecen en el espacio público asesinadas o que son desaparecidas, pues también vemos cómo no se le toma eh, seriedad a sus casos y hoy por hoy la impunidad es la que viste todos estos actos atroces, tan dolorosos, tan difíciles, tan peligrosos, pero que hoy por hoy también estas realidades nos han servido a nosotras, las mujeres eh, en el Avia Yala, en Ciudad Juárez, en México, para organizarnos desde nuestras posibilidades precarias y, y con mucho miedo para lograr hacer frente a, a, este, a este enemigo que día con día asesina y desaparece mujeres sin impunidad. Es, es muy terrible la situación de nosotras las mujeres en todo el mundo, en Avia Yala, en Ciudad Juárez, en México, y es por eso que me siento feliz de saber que pasito a pasito, aún y con la limitante del idioma, las mujeres estamos preocupadas, pero sobre todo ocupadas de frenar esta máquina que nos asesina y desaparece. También me gustaría solamente para terminar agregar que es tan lamentable, triste y dolorosa la situación que ni siquiera tenemos cifras oficiales 
de cuántas mujeres asesinadas y desaparecidas hasta el día de hoy existen. Tenemos estimados de organizaciones, asociaciones civiles que se han dado a la tarea de documentar estos actos y estamos hablando aproximadamente de 2.300 mujeres en el 2021 para atrás. Es una cifra estimada, pero una sola ya era mucho. Así que 2.300 Thank you. Thank you for that, Oveja. Um, so the next, the next question is for Jolene. So you founded the Missing and Murdered Diné Relatives Task Force in New Mexico. Now with Secretary of State Deb Haaland from, Lag from Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico, now taking a similar model to the federal level. What do you hope will come out of it? And this question is for Jolene. Thank you, Kristen. Um, uh, when our collective uh, established Missing and Murdered Deneth Relatives, we were established in March 2019. And um, this was done also with the, uh, with the leadership of uh, one of our uh, tribal leaders named Amber Kinez Bacrati. And we had done some work together uh, in the realm of protecting children, um, sexual and domestic violence. And we felt like this model had to be community-based. Um, it had to be family-centered so that their voices were at the table. Um, so as our work started to continue on, um, and then with the establishment of Operation Lady Justice uh, with the last administration, um, I just want to acknowledge that um, there were some approaches that were harmful to um, the families as well as the communities. Um, it was not a well thought out plan. Although the intention was there, um, we felt like it was also important that we were still at that table um, despite that. Um, so with Secretary Deb Haaland coming in and, and establishing the Missing and Murdered Unit, the MMU under the Secretary of Interior's office, um, I think shines some hope um, we have someone there who understands the issues and what's going on. And I know Secretary Halland has also been a fierce advocate for the missing and murdered uh, issues, um, not only in the Southwest, but nationally. Um, from what I understand, um, that federal task force will also be um, part of the oversight of, of Secretary Halland. And we're really happy that they are also um, wanting to take um, a model such as ours um, to really inspire some of the work that we're doing. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of our work is pushed by um, our community as well as the voices uh, of the families who have been affected by the missing and murdered crisis. Um, they call our attention to issues such as um, the lack of response from the FBI, um, the lack of victim advocates assisting these families. Um, although, folks might think these are minute details. They're incredibly important. Families want to know what the status of those cases are. Families want to know if those cases are even being investigated. And we're really excited that um, the MMU unit is gonna spend and dedicate a lot of time um, working in partnership with some of the policies that are being implemented such as Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act. Um, I'm sure there are some systems fixes that they should be able to figure out, but um, there definitely has to be a lot of time and energy dedicated uh, to the communities, especially the groups and the families who have been engaged in this work for several years. Um, a lot of the advocates who brought the missing and murdered movement to the forefront have been doing this since the 70s. Um, it's an ongoing crisis. Uh, and I think it's really important that at the federal level, um, they're working with the families in a very meaningful way. And it does bring hope. I'm not quite sure um, what the different changes will be, uh, but we're ready to have that conversation and, and we're just, we'll see what happens. Thank you, Jolene. 
Um, Jolene mentioned a uh, Savannah's Act, and I just, for those of you who are not familiar with it, I just want to give you a little context. This is a bill that directs the Department of Justice to review, revise, and develop law enforcement and justice protocols to address missing and murdered Native Americans. Additionally, the Additionally, the bill authorizes the Department of Justice to provide grants for the purposes of one, developing and implementing policies and protocols for law enforcement regarding cases of MMIW, uh, MMIR relatives, and two, compiling uh, an annual, uh, compiling data related to missing and murdered native people. In 2020, Savannah's Act became a law and you can research that more, thank you. So moving on to the next question for Obeja. Um, my organization in Santa Fe, Ogapoge, Three Sisters Collective, um, one of our fundamental um, foundational approaches is through, um, through into our work is through artivism, which is the merging of art and activism. Uh, we use art as a tool to reclaim and rematriate our community here. Art has always been used effectively uh, in indigenous movements to highlight social justice issues. Uh, some of the um, things you see are the um, Oh gosh, I wish I had my mask with the red handprint. That's that's a very um, a big um, image you see often related to MMIW, as well as the red dresses. Um, these are used to bring attention to the issue. In Mexico, I know they use pink crosses um, to draw attention to the issue there. Your art form is hip hop music. Um, can you talk to us about the power of your art and the impact it is making in your community? Sí, claro. El, el rap ha sido una herramienta que a mí me ha permitido poder nombrar las violencias que yo como mujer cotidianamente vivo, porque lamentablemente vivir en una estructura político social como la es el patriarcado, a nosotras como mujeres nos ponen en una categoría abajo de los hombres. Y no, es, eh, y no es la excepción en mi caso, ¿no? Pero también tengo seguro que el arte es la oportunidad del de, de humano o de la humana de poder expresar estos sentimientos, pensamientos y emociones de, de lo que vive día con día. Nacer y crecer en Ciudad Juárez me, pues, me hizo vivir experiencias muy dolorosas, como acostumbrarme a ver pesquisas pegadas en las paredes, donde dice, se busca a una chica, ¿no? Y, y que pasa el tiempo y que esas pesquisas eh, se van desvaneciendo, ¿no? El papel, la tinta desaparece así como también desaparece la exigencia de la presentación con vida de las mujeres. Pero la música tiene, le dicen, el lenguaje universal. Una música, una canción que, que es escrita desde el rap. El rap es como un, un diario personal con ritmo y con poesía y con tus vivencias personales y de tu contexto. Entonces mi rap se volvió un diario de muchas mujeres en Ciudad Juárez que vivíamos y padecíamos la violencia de género y no en carne propia, pero que lamentábamos y repudiábamos estos actos que ocurrían en Ciudad Juárez. El rap hoy por hoy me sigue dando la oportunidad de conectar con mujeres en el mundo que se organizan para nombrar estas violencias, ya que lamentablemente hace unos años atrás, pues nos llamaron exageradas, nos dijeron que nos gustaba hacernos las víctimas y, y otras situaciones muy desagradables respecto a lo que vivíamos las mujeres. Pero sin duda hoy por hoy el arte es una herramienta de transformación social y la ponemos al servicio de esta lucha de nosotras como mujeres para exigir justicia, pero también para nombrar que nos queremos vivas y que nos queremos libres de violencia y que queremos que las niñas crezcan sin miedo de ser niñas, 
¿no? que puedan caminar por las calles sin estar recibiendo constantemente el acoso callejero ¿no? eh, o también que si las niñas son violentadas en sus hogares por sus abuelos, por sus papás, por sus tíos, hermanos, si son violadas o tocadas por ellos, que también tengan la oportunidad de enunciarlo, de nombrarlo. Es por eso que el rap hoy por hoy es un género musical, pero que también es un elemento de la cultura del hip hop que nos permite eh, manifestar estas experiencias que años atrás parecieran que no eran importantes ¿no? o que nadie debía escuchar las palabras de las mujeres por esta misma idea del machismo, ¿no? de que no valemos, de que no es importante. Pero a mí en lo personal el rap me ha dado la oportunidad de ocupar un lugar en el mundo, un mundo que no está eh, pensado para nosotras las mujeres eh, en el micrófono, en la toma de decisiones importantes, ¿no? Así que acá en Ciudad Juárez las cruces rosas se iniciaron a pintar por la mamá, por una de las mamás que buscan y exigen justicia para su hija. Y desde ahí, eh, activistas, activistas, mujeres en general, hemos replicado esta cruz negra sobre un fondo rosa para exigir, para sumarnos a la exigencia de justicia, para sumarnos a, a, a que se active una alerta, eh, no solo en Juárez, no solo en México, en el mundo entero, que sepan que las mujeres eh, asesinadas y desaparecidas, pobres, migrantes, hijas de obreras, que han venido a esta ciudad en búsqueda de mejores oportunidades para su vida, hoy por hoy no tienen justicia, hoy por hoy no hay castigo para los culpables. El arte sin duda es una herramienta que convierte a esta exigencia tan dura y tan difícil en, una, en algo más viable de escuchar con ritmo, con, con poesía, porque quizás nuestras demandas son alarmantes, pero nosotras decimos que es más alarmante vivir como vivimos ¿no? en impunidad y lejos de políticas públicas que salvaguarden nuestra integridad como mujeres. Y es por eso que le apostamos al arte, al activismo, porque sabemos que es una posibilidad, nos da esperanza de que el mundo puede ser diferente. No porque cantemos o bailemos o pintemos, ¿verdad? En sí, aunque esas actividades, claro que tienen un impacto positivo en nuestras personas, nos ayudan a desarrollarnos integralmente como personas. Pero también sabemos hoy por hoy que el arte, el activismo que hemos emprendido muchas mujeres en este país, tiene que ver con la profunda necesidad de exigir que paren de asesinarnos, que paren de desaparecernos, que paren de violentar a las niñas o que paren de hacernos creer que ser mujer es algo malo o es algo bajo o no importante. Hoy por hoy el rap es la oportunidad que me hace estar frente a ustedes para decirle al mundo que habemos mujeres que le apostamos a, a la música, a, al hip hop, como una cultura que nos da un lugar en el mundo. Y no porque nos lo obsequiaron, sino porque nosotras decidimos hacerlo. Thank you. Thank you, Obeja. Okay. Um, let's see. So this next question is for all of the panelists. Um, how about I'll start with Jolene first. So it is incredibly difficult to get the public and our legislators to understand that the abuse and murder of women around the world is one of the greatest systemic crises on the planet. What are some of your recommendations that our audience can engage in that will support your work and bring greater awareness to MMIWG to us? And Jolene, I'll start with you. 
Yeah, you're right. Um, this crisis definitely is a systemic issue. Um, a lot of the times we hear, you know, the system's broken, what can we do to fix it? Um, but I just want to acknowledge that the system is not broken. It's working exactly as it was designed. Um, a lot of the missing and murdered issues stem from colonization and implemented um, genocide, femicide, forced sterilization of indigenous women, trafficking of indigenous women in all of the Americas and the islands. Um, and that's where it started. And a lot of those policies have carried over. Um, so I think it's really going to take the dismantling of some of these systems. Um, and I know a lot of policy changes are being implemented uh, at this point. Um, but I think uplifting a lot of the community work is what's needed. Supporting the folks who are on the ground, um, making those meaningful and direct changes uh, with the families and the communities, with the community leaders, um, and then holding their local leadership accountable as well and starting these conversations. Um, and another question we get is, you know, what does allyship look like when it comes to these, to these issues for folks who are benefiting from the systems of white supremacy, who have that privilege to move through this world in a better, uh, more easier way? Um, I would say start those conversations uh, within your groups as well. Um, support the organizations, um, go to their websites, educate yourself, um, throw some money their way, uh, because just a little bit does go a long way. Um, for instance, when we get our donations, we were able to buy a drone to help one of our sister organizations uh, do search and rescue on the ground. Um, when agencies aren't able to come and do the search and rescue on behalf of the families, um, that's where we come in as a community and help bring those uh, resources to them. Uh, we also provide uh, resources to families, um, donating um, food or water, anything like that when a relative does go missing. Um, those types of support really go a long way. Um, but also placing pressure on leadership to really pass these meaningful legislations that are taking place right now. Um, I think one of the more significant shifts that are happening is when Secretary Halland was appointed. Um, there was so much resistance against that. And it's so amazing that I can look at one of the top cabinet positions in our nation and see myself. Um, and I think that's a beacon of hope. So um, yeah, I think those are just some of the ways to really support and uplift what's what's taking place out there. Thank you. Okay, I'll repeat the question uh, for Obeha. So um, what are, uh, it is incredibly difficult to get the public and legislation to understand the abuse of MMIW around the world. So Obeha, what are some of your recommendations that our audience can engage in that will support your work and bring greater awareness to MMIW G2S. Uy, se puede hacer mucho y se necesita hacer mucho, pero personalmente creo que la educación es muy importante. Eh, la educación en un sentido donde eh, a los niños no se les eduque pensando que son superiores a las mujeres. Eh, y no solamente con esta frase de no, to, no golpees a una mujer con, ni con un pétalo de una rosa, ¿no? sino más allá de esas frases que por acá escuchamos mucho, es más bien eh, educar a las niñas, a los niños, a las niñas en una educación donde partamos de que somos personas todas, todos, todes, que somos personas que merecemos respeto, que somos valiosas, que el color de piel no es importante, que la posición económica, eso tampoco define la importancia de las personas, que el país donde naciste tampoco es determinante para hacer valer a una persona, pero también es importante decir a las niñas que somos personas eh, que valemos mucho, que merecemos respeto, que ninguna persona puede 
elegir sobre nuestras cuerpos porque son nuestras cuerpos y también creo importante que los compañeros varones se se cuestionen este ser hombre en esta estructura patriarcal machista misógina porque desde ellos tienen que empezar a deconstruir todos estos estereotipos que los han formado como hombres, ¿no? En la medida que ellos logren identificar esos estereotipos que nos afectan directamente a nosotras, creo yo que pudiera ser posible entrar en el diálogo, ¿no? No porque seamos mujeres valemos más que ellos o ellas, pero lamentablemente en el sistema patriarcal, machista en el que vivimos, eso se enseña desde la casa, ¿no? Entonces también en casa, la educación y los valores tienen que ver con el respeto a las personas, independientemente de clase, raza, género, eh, lugar de nacimiento, ¿no? Y que también la indiferencia no sea parte de nuestra cotidianidad, que de, en la medida que podamos manifestar nuestro repudio a estos actos, hoy por hoy las redes, el internet, son los medios que nos permiten saber que hoy por hoy en Colombia el gobierno viola a las mujeres que salen a manifestarse eh, esas prácticas. Es importante que en cualquier geografía que estemos, nosotras las mujeres, los hombres, les compañeros, nos manifestemos en nuestras redes personales y repudiemos estos actos que no podemos seguir siendo indiferentes o quizás algunas veces pensamos con ponerlo en Facebook o en Instagram, eso no va a cambiar y claramente así no va a cambiar, pero hoy por hoy las redes sí tienen un impacto que mucha gente ve que mucha gente utiliza. Entonces, bombardeemos esas redes con estas manifestaciones que dejen clara nuestra posición de cero tolerancia a cualquier forma de abuso, cero tolerancia a cualquier forma de discriminación. Y se me ocurren muchas más cosas, pero creo que eso está en nuestras manos. Y también... Eh, sumarnos o apoyar a las compañeras que desde espacios de legislación están haciendo trabajo, que de alguna u otra forma podamos desde el arte quizás, ¿no? Propaganda, difundir campañas, ¿no? De fondeos, de todo esto. Creo que la solidaridad de nuestros esfuerzos y, y la difusión de nuestros proyectos en pro de nosotras, las mujeres, y por ende de la humanidad, es importante que las difundamos, así como nuestras opiniones respecto a los acontecimientos tan desafortunados que vivimos las mujeres, y la educación, en la casa, en la escuela, en todos los espacios, necesitamos deconstruir estereotipos que nos han formado, y que lamentablemente hoy por hoy son factores que permiten que estos actos sucedan y que sean impunes socialmente. Entonces, a emitir nuestras opiniones y comentarios en nuestras redes, con nuestras amigas, con nuestra familia, con nuestros amigos, organizarnos en colectivas, organizaciones y desde abajo impulsar estas nuevas formas de ser mujeres libres de violencia y por ende una humanidad que vive en respeto y armonía. Gracias, Obeja, for your powerful words. Um, I just I want to add that there's been a recent phenomenon on Instagram and social media over the last like 24 hours uh, around the um, sharing of um, posts around the MMIW um, R movement. So. Um, we and in the indigenous community have seen um, 
erasing of messages on Instagram. So um, I'm just bringing that to your attention because it seems to be something we're still trying to figure out what's going on in the last like 24 hours, literally. So um, I really feel that there's an attempt of, um, of, um, of shutting down posts around with hashtags of MMIW. Uh, so that's another thing um, that we need to take into consideration is the, um, the mechanisms at which we are sharing our information um, because they are still um, tools and they're being monitored and overseen by really big entities. And so that's something just to take into consideration. Um, a question had been asked, um, and I think Obeha did already a great job of answering that to a certain extent, but the question from a, um, a panel, uh, an attendee is, in what ways are you addressing the toxic culture of violent masculinity uh, that contributes to femicide and violence against women and violence overall? And um, I think the narrative is going to shift. I feel a real strong shift this year in um, addressing the fact that this is not we didn't create this problem as women. It is a product of the toxic patriarchal culture that we are enmeshed in. And yet women are being tasked to solve this problem on top of you know, everything else women are expected to do in our communities. And I think up here in the North, we have, um, I like to call it Miho syndrome, um, but it's also a sunny boy syndrome that, uh, that they use in the Diné and Navajo communities. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But really I think, um, there's this uh, kind of, um, as women, as mothers, as matriarchs, I think we feel for our men. Men have gone through a lot in, in, in this system. Um, their life ways in so many of our uh, tribal communities have been taken away from them. Um, they've been used as tools of colonial violence in the legacy of the military. Um, you have displacement, you have alcoholism. We have all these social ills in our communities that are a direct result of neo-colonialism. And, um, and I think there may be a tendency to feel sorry for our men, our, our, our mijos, our men, and, and, and almost like bathe them to a certain extent. Um, because I think another thing is women, we've been holding it down in our indigenous communities. We are mothers, mothers, we're holding down the space for our children. And so yes, we are equally impacted, but also I think we feel this tendency inherently to take care of our men. But at what point does it cross over into enabling? And so I uh, really just want to address that. Um, but really, this, this, this is the year that I want to see the tide change from it being our responsibility as women to solve this problem and to really start calling in our brothers to step next to us, step next to us in this movement. There is no moving forward. Women are the life givers in our communities. Indigenous people will not thrive or survive into the indigenous futurisms that we are dreaming and our ancestors have prayed for us if, they, if there is no women. So until we come back to the fundamental understandings of women as the portal between the spiritual realm and the earthly realm that brings our new generations into fruition, we cannot move forward without our men upholding the sacredness of women in our communities. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Jolene and um, I wanna hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those powerful words, Christina. They resonate, very much resonate. Um, I think that conversation is also starting to happen on the Navajo Nation. Um, as Christina mentioned, we call it sunny boy syndrome. Uh, sunny boy is actually a term of endearment um, to our young Navajo men um, who, you know, generally take care of the family um, and have some of those responsibilities. Um, but growing up as a Diné woman, I can recognize a lot of the double standards that uh, that are within our lived experiences. Um, I know, um, like from my experience, um, my brothers were able to do what our parents supported and doing whatever it is that they wanted to do. Um, but there was a higher level of expectation um, that would be placed and responsibility placed on uh, Diné women. And um, at times I feel like it gets to a point where it's, um, where Christina mentioned it being enabling or kind of like coddling where when these bad behaviors happen, um, no one 
is calling in our male relatives um, to correct those behaviors. Uh, case in point, there was a recent murder of Tammy Begay in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, just a quick warning, I'm going to talk a little bit about this case. Um, Tammy was a dental hygienist student who was on her way to do amazing things and um, had been with her partner and another couple while she was being murdered, there was another male relative not too far, just a couple of steps away um, and did not step in, did not come to protect. And um, could the situation have been different? I think so. And I, I just wanna say that blatantly that the outcome could have been different, um, but also want to acknowledge did our relative who was not able to step in, did they have the tools to? Did someone talk to that relative about protecting our women? Um, what did, you know, what does healthy masculinity look like um, that allowed this to happen? Um, so there's so many questions around that. And um, a lot of our men also experience trauma. They experience um, sexual trauma. And a lot of times because of masculinity, don't come forward. Um, there's a saying that hurt people hurt people. And that's incredibly true. So along with having our male relatives come into this um, conversation, um, we also have to think about what um, acknowledging the traumas that they've gone through. How do we make that space for them to be able to feel comfortable enough to start addressing those traumas so that it doesn't come out in these types of behaviors that are hurting our women, that are hurting our children um, in that way. And I think in many tribal communities, especially when it comes to offender accountability, um, folks who do, do cause harm are not throwaways because we're all related in some way. Um, someone's brother, someone's father, uh, someone's cousin um, are not easily ostracized. And in some cases, that's also enabling, but we also have to give the tools to our communities to have those conversations about how do we have accountability uh, when harm is caused? Um, how do we create support services where our men feel heard, where our boys feel heard, uh, who are also experiencing those traumas? So um, it's very much so many questions um, at one time, but I feel like, that those conversations need to happen. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. <sighs> Sorry, such a, such a hard topic to talk about. <sighs> so on behalf of NOW and Black Women's Blueprint, I want to thank our amazing panelists and my co-moderator, Chris, Dr. Christina, for taking the time to speak with us today. And to thank all of you who have attended, um, if not all of the conversations we've hosted over these last uh, 100 days of the Biden-Harris administration. We have seen some new and inspiring changes from the administration, but we all know our work is not done. So we encourage y'all to continue to educate yourselves on the various topics we've discussed in the series and to take action in all the ways you can. Please stay tuned for a toolkit that we are creating and all the actions of our panelists have invited us to take part in. We hope that these conversations have been as generative and inspiring for you as they have been for us. Thank you.